Welcome, online people. <laughs> okay. Uh, all right. I'm going to pop that down there. Your Sunday silly for the day. Joe and Bubba are sitting in a boat fishing. Bubba says to Joe, I think I'm going to break up with my girlfriend. She hasn't talked to me in two months. Joe thought about it for a second and said, you better think that over. A girl like that's hard to find. <laughs> All right, our scripture today comes from Mark, the Gospel of Mark, chapter 10, verses 35 through 45. Here's our Lumo Project video. You can follow along with your scripture or just listen watching um, to our... And James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came up to him and said to him, Teacher, we want you to do for us whatever we ask of you. And he said to them, What do you want me to do for you? And they said to him, Grant us to sit, one at your right hand and one at your left, in your glory. Jesus said to them, You do not know what you are asking. Are you able to drink the cup that I drink, or to be baptized with the baptism with which I am baptized? And they said to him, We are able. And Jesus said to them, The cup that I drink you will drink, and with the baptism with which I am baptized you will be baptized. But to sit at my right hand or at my left is not mine to grant, but it is for those for whom it has been prepared. And when the ten heard it, they began to be indignant at James and John. And Jesus called them to him and said to them, You know that those who are considered rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their great ones exercise authority over them but it shall not be so among you. But whoever would be great among you must be your servant, and whoever would be first among you must be slave of all. For even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Okay. Well represented. Here's our main idea. Leaders in the kingdom of God must be servants, not sultans. Very simple, but at the same time profound. And what a contrast to the world. Leaders in the kingdom of God must be servants, not sultans. So the 12 disciples have listened to Jesus' teaching on servant leadership, but it hasn't sunk in yet. And because they're anticipating a worldly kingdom, coming through Jesus, they expect that when they go into Jerusalem, there's going to be, uh, you know, they're going to pro pronounce Jesus king and, and they, somebody's going to be his right hand men. So James and John audaciously ask Jesus ahead of time to give them the highest positions of honor under him and his kingdom when it comes. This provides, of course, another opportunity for Jesus to teach them on the nature of true greatness in the kingdom of God and what it means to be leaders. So, let's go verse by verse, walking through it one by one, make some observations. As I say all the time, feel free to uh, interrupt and ask questions or make comments. Um, just put your little godly paw up in the air and wave at me and and uh, let me know, and we'll, we'll pause. Okay? So we begin with verse 35, and some of these I'll probably go over pretty quickly so that we can spend time in dialogue. James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came up to him and said to him, so James and John are the sons of Zebedee. You may recall from way back in chapter 1 that they were fishermen. Um, James, uh, John is probably the younger, uh, one of the youngest disciples, and um, obviously, he write, wrote the Gospel of John and First and Second John, Third John, and the Book of Revelation. Um, James doesn't last long. We'll get to that. Um, they are nicknamed the Sons of Thunder because of their brash, fiery temperaments, and this is one example of that. So they were uh, fiery, fiery temperaments. Now. 
That being said, let's read or have our reader read Matthew 20, 20 through 21. Who's got Matthew 20? And then the mother of the sons of Zebedee came to him with her sons, bowing down and making a request of him. And he said to her, What do you wish? She said to him, Command that in your kingdom these two sons of mine may sit one on your right and one on your left. All right. So... James and John, what's now, you know, when there's not a discrepancy there, what's going on is that it would, it would be considered doing the same thing to have somebody to appeal for you. They pulled the family card on Jesus <laughs> by having, this is actually Jesus, um, James and John were distant relatives of Jesus. So by having his aunt, Jesus's aunt, Salome, um, make the request for them. Talk about missing the mark. We won't be leaders, but we're going to ask our mom to, to you know. Um, so either way, uh, whether she did it first and then they came and, 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 and say, yeah, we want that, or, or whether they're kind of there in the background, either the way, here's the point. Teacher, we want you to do for us whatever we ask of you. Okay. And it's per, put in the form of a proverbial blank check, you know. Come on in, ladies. It's okay. No interruptions. Not, okay. We're not worried about it. The proverbial blank check, right? Like sometimes we'll say, hey, will you do me a favor? Before we say what the favor is. <laughs> you prom will you do something for me? You know, Lindsay does that. She's really good at it. She gets those doe eyes working. Honey. <laughs> She wants that promise ahead of time before I say it. And I'm, real, I'm a stinker. I'm like, maybe. <laughs> but notice these two key words. We want. Or whatever we ask. This reveals self-centeredness. Whatever we want. We want you to do for us whatever we ask. of. It's about them. It's about we. In fact, the tense of the Greek indicates that they have a specific request in mind. Um, not only do they ha not have the courage to ask themselves, but have their mom do it for them, they also delay in even getting to the point. That's another trick we sometimes do. Seems like the, long, the, the, the harder, the bigger the request, the longer we wait in, to get to it. Dale. Um, true confession. Mm-hmm. <laughs> just, just teasing. What's your confession, Dale? True confession. Mm -hmm. Cheryl and I had met, and I was bucked off a horse, broke my back um, a month later. And so through this period, drugs were very important. Um, because it turns out, they told me I wasn't broken, but I was. Mm -hmm. And so Oxycontin made me a different person. Mm -hmm. And during that time, I, I so boldly asked her, if I was to ask you to marry me, what would you say? Mm -hmm. <laughs> so how is that beating around the book? Yeah, kind of the same thing. <laughs> I don't want to know. <laughs> Hypothetically speaking. Yeah. My mother was still living at the time, but I didn't have her ask for me. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay. So here's Jesus' response, verse 36. And he said to them, what do you want me to do for you? What do you want me to do for you? Obviously, we don't need to elaborate too much on this. It's, it's fairly obvious. Jesus wants them to get to the point. All right, come on. Come on, boys. What is interesting Oddly enough, Jesus will ask Bartimaeus the same question in the next sequence. Look down at verse 51. <coughs> Old blind Bartimaeus that I preached about a few weeks back. Uh, contrast their answers. Bartimaeus, what does Bartimaeus want? He just wants to see. He wants to see. And, but here these, these guys, they're, they're, they want it all 
and they want it now, right, Asher? Like we were talking about the, before class. So who do you think represents the better disciple? The, I want they, to sit on the left because we know God was going to sit on Jesus. Uh, on the right side of God was Jesus, so he couldn't sit on the right side. So they wanted to ask. To sit on the right side was messing up. You're, you're making this way too complicated. <laughs> <laughs> is like, that your right or my left? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. Bart, Bartimaeus in his humility uh, <coughs> answered the question better. And they, oh yeah, go ahead, Larry. Like, they, asked, they asked Jesus to do this, mm -hmm. you know, yes or no. And he didn't give the yes, and he answered the question with a question, mm -hmm. which is, he did that before. Too. Yeah, he, he's really good at that, and that's always a great, well, for me, it's a good stall tactic. Uh -huh. <laughs> Why would you ask that, honey? <laughs> think, so, think, 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 what did I do, what did I say, think. So uh, Cheryl did when you asked her? Yes. <laughs> Why would you ask? <laughs> ask a question with a question. And so they get to the point in verse 37. They say to him, grant us to sit. One at your right hand and one at your left in your glory. So if you're reading from the NIV or NLT, they kind of soften it a little bit. But it literally says, give to us the right to sit at the high and, and the right hand and the left hand in that culture would be the highest positions of honor uh, and authority. Um, when Jesus becomes king. Now, there's some good and some bad here. You might want to jot some of this down um, because I've been tending to highlight the bad, but we want to give them a fair shake. Here's the good. James and John do believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Messiah. They anticipate that Jesus will receive a kingdom and receive glory in that kingdom. So there's faith there. That's good. They believe that he is who he says he is. But as we've seen in the past, the bad is they're misunderstanding the nature of Jesus' Messiahship. What does it mean to be the Savior? Is he going to be the conquering king, hero, general um, that's going to ride in on the white horse and flatten the enemy? And, uh, you know, what, what kind of king is he going to be? Well, he rides in on a donkey. On a, on a colt, humbly. Um, we'll see that in a few weeks. Uh, and more than anything here, obviously, they're acting selfishly, self-centered, it says, or, or is a, a good way to put it. So there's good and they're bad. Can you think of any other good or bad here? Kind of, those want, are the highlights, but... They want glory for themselves. It is, they, want, they do want to take, get a little glory for themselves. And we're not, and if we're not careful, we can slide into that too, can't we? Mm -hmm. It's real easy. We'll talk about that when we get to applications. And they're trying to cut out their buddies. Oh, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Jesus, come over here, man. Yeah, 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 yeah. Absolutely, absolutely. So Jesus answers here in verse thirty-eight, the first part of it. You do not know what you're asking. So this is truly a case of ignorance. It is foolishness. They are self-exalting. They're being knuckleheads and selfish. But to be fair, they simply do not know what they are asking for. And as the saying goes, as we were talking about, Donna, thank God for unanswered prayers. If only they knew exactly what they were asking for and what it would be, tr what it would truly bring, to be at Jesus's right and there will be two at Jesus's right and left in His glory when He gets to the cross. Um, thank God, sometimes He tells us no. Sue. Well, reading that, the I I, I read it to the point that. Uh, they, they believed that Jesus was the Christ or the Messiah. Mm -hmm. But on the other hand, they misunderstood the, the fact that he was from God and not the world. Mm -hmm. And they wanted him to be of the world. Yeah, yeah. And that's why they asked for the positions that they, they did. Yeah, elsewhere he says, my kingdom's not of this world. Mm -hmm. 
Um, eventually it will come to this world, what they call the millennial reign, and of course eventually heaven on earth. Um, but that's in the book of Revelation. You'd have to go to... Well, no, she, she moved on from Revelation. Vicki taught on Revelation. for Maybe someday I'll get to Revelation. Yeah. I don't know. Um, but here, then he asks them a question. Are you able to drink the cup that I drink or to be baptized with the baptism with which I am baptized? So there's some symbolism here that we need to explore. Uh, some me, uh, metaphor. What, what, uh, what, what does that mean? Jesus' time of glory is coming. But the disciples are still blind to the path of suffering that leads to the glory. Jesus will have glory. He will be on the throne um, as King of kings and Lord of lords. But the path to that glory leads through the suffering of the cross. And so what does the cup mean? Well, I'm just going to flat out tell you, the cup represents the wrath of God upon sinners. And here's some scripture to back that up. We don't like that word wrath, but it is a biblical word. Isaiah 51, verse 17. Who's got Isaiah 51? Okay. Wake yourself. Wake yourself. Stand up, O Jerusalem. You have drunk from the hand of the Lord the cup of his wrath who have drawn to the dregs, the bowl, the cup of staggering. Okay, so the, the Old Testament analogy of the cup is like a cup of wine that somebody forces you to take, and you have to take the whole thing. Usually it's a bad thing. Every once in a while it's put in a good context. But most of the time it's this, um, it's this cup that you, <laughs> it's, it's your poison. You know, uh, you, you take it and you have to take the whole thing. Uh, in Isaiah's case, it was obviously uh, the wrath of God upon the punishment that God inflicted through the exile because of the disobedience and idolatry of God's people in the Old Testament. Um, when it comes to the New Testament, it's Jesus taking, uh, bearing the brunt of God's anger towards sin for us. So he, it's, it's, he's intervening for us and taking the, the, the righteous anger that God has towards sin and sinners. Jesus bears that for us. Uh, Psalm 75, 8 is another passage. Okay, Claudia? In the hand of the Lord is a cup full of foaming wine mixed with spices. He pours it out and all of the wicked of the earth drink it down to its very dregs. Okay, so another... Uh, Another imagery there of a cup of wine. Uh, it's it's the, the wrath of God in this context. But well, what about baptism? Well, it's a similar idea. They, they're, they go with one another and basically mean the same thing. The judgment of God that washes over sinners like a flood. Uh, we think of Psalm 88, verse 7. Your wrath lies heavy upon me and you overwhelm me with all your waves you overwhelm me with all your waves uh, or like what happened to Jonah Jonah chapter 2 verse 3 who's got Jonah okay you hurled, hurled me into the deep uh, into the very heart of the seas and the current swirled around me all your waves and breaks Breakers swept over me. Say, all your waves and breakers wash over me. There was an old song, an old hymn we used to sing. I was sinking deep in sin, far from the peaceful shore. Can you help me? Uh, <laughs> um, sinking to rise no more. Then the master of the sea heard my despair and cry. From the waters lifted me, now safe am I. Am I the only one? Love lifted me, love lifted me, when nothing else could help love. So any, anyway, so there's this, um, when we think of baptism, we usually think of it in terms of a good thing. And it is a good thing, like we saw today with, with Addie. Um, 
But it can also mean, uh, and there was actually uh, several passages back, a similar, for Jesus used it in a similar way. It's something that washes over you, that drowns you, that, that immerses you. Um, so it's, it's like being drowned. Okay? Hopefully that helps you understand. So they, he, Jesus asked them, are you able to go through what I'm going through, going to have to go through? And they boldly say, here's the th sons of thunder. Oh, yes, we are able. Oh, yes, we can handle that. Uh, obviously, the correct answer is no. None of us would be able to do what Jesus did for us. Even if we could just handle the physical suffering of, of the cross, because thousands and thousands of people were crucified, not just Jesus. Do half of it. Yeah, <laughs> but we yeah, but we could yeah we couldn't do the resurrection part, and it wouldn't have any vicarious effects, would it? I can't die for you, and you can't die for me like Jesus dies for us. Mm -hmm. Asher, how about those who go and serve in the military and die for others? Yes, as we've seen, mm -hmm. person running for senate. Mm -hmm. Who's totally burnt? Oh yeah, I mean, totally burnt. Yeah, it's got the scars from it. Yeah. How about these folks? I mean, they basically enact what Jesus had. There is an admirable sacrifice for that. Yeah, um, and Jesus says there is no greater love than to offer up your life for another. Um, and that's what those soldiers do, and we should honor them for that. Um, but there's no substitution of that. Right. Correct. That doesn't save, it, it gives us freedom, but it doesn't give us eternal freedom or salvation. Um, but it is emulating God, and, and they should be honored, remembered, and commended for it. But only Jesus, the perfectly holy Lamb of God, can die for lost sinners. And that's, uh, the belief is described with some fancy Bible terms like substitution, meaning he died in our place. That's basically what vicarious means as well. He died for me. He died in my place. Atonement is covering, but that's the same thing. Uh, another word like that is propitiation. Now, you don't have to know those words to get into heaven, thankfully. <laughs> Um, but I do like to mention those words um, because they are very rich with meaning. Uh, now, we don't know exactly what James and John thought the cup and the baptism were. Maybe they thought that the cup and baptism was going to battle for Jesus or, or, or fighting for him or something like that. But they are, at this point, they're still clueless as to its real meaning. And Jesus said to them, Okay, the cup that I drink, you will drink. And with the baptism with which I am baptized, you will be baptized. Now, it's important to realize that James and John's cup and baptism are different from those of Jesus, right? They include things like persecution, sacrifice, suffering, but only Jesus could die for our sins. So Jesus is saying, you're going to experience the same thing that I experienced from the world. You don't know what you're asking for, but you will find out. Uh, and how? what did they find out? Well, James will be the first martyr, the first person, the first apostle killed for their faith. You see that in Acts 12 too. Did I assign that to somebody? Yeah, I did. Okay. And he had, he had, and he had James, the brother of John, put to death with the sword. Okay, uh, he becomes the first martyr restored, or uh, recorded in the book of Acts, uh, and then John will be forced to live in exile. We find that in Revelation one nine. I, John, your brother and companion in the suffering and kingdom and patient endurance that are, G are ours in Jesus was in the island of Patmos because of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. 
Yeah. He was exiled to the island of Patmos, which is probably not too of a bad place to be exiled in, but he was, and he would have limited freedom there, but it was basically house arrest uh, in the Mediterranean, but it was, uh, but it was still house arrest. Uh, now, I think church tradition goes on to say that John does die for his faith. I can't remember, and it's not recorded in scripture, I can't remember what the context was. Of course, all the other apostles die for their faith as well. But here he gets to the, the point that they're asking in verse 40. But to sit at my right hand or at my left, it's not mine to grant. It is for those for whom it has been prepared. So the cup, the baptism of suffering that the disciples were experience. Uh, this is a cup that doesn't have any salvation effect on other people. But it is for their own growth, their own uh, growth in godliness and surrender and sanctification as well as God's glory. Um, and Peter talks about that in 1 Peter chapter 4, verses 12 through 13. And that's something we can experience as well at times. Dear friends, do not be surprised at the fiery ordeal that has come on you to test you as though something strange were happening to you. But rejoice in as much as you participate in the sufferings of Christ so that you may be overjoyed when his glory is revealed. Okay, so you see similar themes there. Mm -hmm. Suffering, glory, um, with Christ. And that's something we as believers, we don't typically experience that in, in America. Um, but uh, we see it across the world in places like China and, and Ukraine, and North Africa, uh, even a little bit north into Canada to some degree. We see in prisons, people imprisonated and stuff. So um, it's interesting, not mine, those two words, not mine, <coughs> is, it's emphatic in Greek. So um, Jesus always submits to his heavenly father. There's this mysterious mutual submission within the Godhead. Submission and admiration. You know, we, we wrestle, if you're like me, you wrestle with understanding God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit and, and how they interrelate and are one and yet uh, three. Um, but Jesus always submits to the, his heavenly father uh, especially on earth. Um, and apparently this is one of those prerogatives that's up to God the Father to, for who to grant such honors in, in the kingdom of heaven, or at least at this time. Okay, verse 41, and this is what Larry was getting at. And when the ten heard it, they, became, they began to be indignant at James and John. Uh, indignant. What's uh, maybe some other translations that you got there if you're following along? Is there any angry or... Disgusted. Disgusted. I like that. Okay. Now, why do you think the other ten apostles are upset with James and John? Because they didn't want to be treated like chopped liver, right? Yeah, yeah. Felt like. Yeah. It's not a holy thing, is it? Mm -hmm. Competition. Competition. It shows their humanity. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this is not righteous indignation here for sure, um, because they've been just as as just as self centered as James and John. Man, they need to get this air conditioning yeah. fixed in here. In fact, they continue to be sinfully competitive even up to the night of the Passover. Jesus. Uh, uh, Luke twenty two twenty four. 24, uh, we didn't chase that one down, but uh, right during the Passover, they have another big argument about who's the greatest. On the very night that Jesus is being betrayed, in fact, it's right after he says that one of you is going to betray me. First, they begin arguing about who that's going to be, and somehow that turns into a conversation on who's the best. Isn't that crazy? And that's how easy, how quick it happens that we can get um, sidetracked um, 
I only had three brothers, but we sat at a couple of tables sniping each other every <laughs> night, you know. Yeah. I remember my brothers getting into it pretty my bad. Dad had a, he was German, so my dad had a, a thing he would do. He would, when we started arguing with each other, he'd find his fist on the table and what's a silverware shake, you know, you know, so that meant stop it. Yeah. And so Jesus takes this opportunity. He's like, all right, it's time for another lesson here. He called them or summoned them, that's a key word, and said to them, you know that those who are considered rulers or leaders of the Gentiles, he, he specifically highlights the Gentiles, lord it over them. Um, so he summons them to this breakout, impromptu breakout session, that's what we call them today, on leadership. Uh, and nine times in Mark, this word called or summoned is used, and it's always in the context of an important lesson. So this is, this is what you don't want to miss. This is what they needed to hear and what we need to hear, although obviously the scriptures are thick with meaning and application. But he says, he, he highlights the contrast. And that's what I want you to see is the contrast. Worldly rulers rule typically with a heavy hand. Are there some examples of servant leaders outside of the Christian context? Yes. But typically, sinful worldly rulers rule with a heavy hand. They're ambitious. They're prideful. They're abusive. They're self-promoting. They're domineering. Sometimes even good leaders are that way. And their great ones exercise authority over them. Second part of verse 42. Uh, that word is katakarusian. Again, you don't have to know that when they get into heaven. Praise the Lord. Uh, I wouldn't know it if I couldn't read it in front of me. Katakarusian. That sounds like... Uh, 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 Lando Calrissian, that's what you can say. Uh, to, to gain mastery over or to exp, uh, have exert power over others, to subdue others, or even to function as a despot. Uh, that's, uh, you know, that's what he's talking about. Again, we're all familiar with how the worldly rule. We've all had, I mean, we've all had a bad boss or a bad coach or a bad teacher. Sometimes we've probably done that ourselves at times. We don't really need to go too much into the that. But, here's the contrast, but it shall not be so among you. Or it literally says, it is not that way among you. But whoever would be great among you must be your servant. So there's the contrast. And here's the, here's the exhortation, the, the command. Don't lead like the world. We're all leaders to some degree, in some small way, in the church or at home or family, community, we all have leadership roles to some degree, or you will. Don't lead like the world. Learn to lead like Christ. There's no place among Christians for that domineering, self-exalting leadership. Mm -hmm. yes. The expression is Lord over them. Yes, <laughs> Lord over them. Very common. Uh, 1 Peter 5, 3 through 6, here's what Peter learned after the fact and how he recorded it. First Peter 5, 3 through 6. Did I assign that one to anybody? Can somebody look it up? That. You I'm got good. it? Yeah. Claudia. Not lording over or not lording it over those entrusted to you, but being examples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the crown of, crown of glory that will never fade away. In the same way, you who are younger, submit yourselves to your elders. All of you, clothe yourselves with humility towards one another because God opposes the proud but shows favor to the humble. Mm -hmm. Humble yourselves, therefore, under God's mighty hand that he may lift you up in due time. Yeah, so he's specifically talking to elders and leaders of the church. It's one of my favorite passages. So our leadership should be different mm -hmm. than the world. Pastoral leadership should be different from the world. Sometimes it is. 
Sometimes it's not. We've, we've all seen and heard stories uh, where it's not, or we've experienced it ourselves. Uh, greatness, uh, Walter Wessel said it this way, greatness in the kingdom of God is not achieved by asserting rank, what the disciples are trying to do, but by humble service. It's about service. That word servant, by the way, is diakonos, from which we get our word deacon. And it literally means to wait on tables, to be a table waiter. Christians are notoriously rude to waiters. If you ask, if you ask a waiter who are the worst people to serve, they will consistently say the Sunday afternoon crowd, those who come. The worst tippers and the rudest to the waiters. Um, and yet here, Christ is telling us we should be like the ones waiting on tables. So, Christian, be a good tipper and treat your, your, ser your servers well. I've been on the flip side of that. And it, there's nothing worse than being humiliated or, you know. Anyway, that's a whole other sermon. And whoever would be first among you must be slave of all. So here's another paradox for emphasis. Paradox, um, oxymoron, whatever. It doesn't, it, it's this uh, dissonance, this dissonance that catches our attention. Slave is from the word doulos. It's sometimes translated servant, but the more accurate translation is slave, bond slave which was even lower than a table waiter, even lower. Oftentimes in the ancient world, slaves were conquered foes or people who were so far into debt that they had no cho choice but to <coughs> become the slave of the person they were in debt to. So the thought of being a slave or a slave being first is ob obviously absurd. That's an oxymoron. That's a paradox. In the world's economy, no one is lower than a slave. But here, in God's kingdom, humble obedience, the characteristics of a slave, and personal sacrifice is greatness. That's what it means to be great. All right, we're almost there, I promise. I didn't realize we're at 37 minutes. For even, okay, verse 45, and here's the punchline. Remember, Jesus loves punchlines. Here's the punchline. It's not a joke, it, but it's the punchline. For even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve. And how's that expressed? To give his life as a ransom for many. So who's the ultimate example of this greatness? Jesus himself, the Son of Man. And we talked all about the Son of Man last week. Um, and why is he that example? Because not even he, the Son of God, the Son of Man, that exalted figure that's going to be at God's right hand and come with the clouds of glory, not even he came to be served, to be waited on, to be catered to. Instead, he came as the servant. He came to serve and to give. Notice those two words. He came to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. And how is that expressed? Well, by offering his life as a ransom. Lytron, Lytron is the word. Uh, I hope you're extraordinarily impressed by that. Um, which means, you know what a ransom is. It's the price of release. It was used to describe the money paid to emancipate a slave. Um, it's used elsewhere to, to stand for redemption. So it's the price it costs to release a slave. Jesus gave his life to release us from our slavery to sin, death, and hell. Um, now, Origen in the third century surmised that this was a price paid to Satan. That is a wrong teaching. That's er erroneous. There's no... Uh, Scripture that indicates that at all. Satan, in fact, is presented in the Scriptures as a foe to be defeated and conquered, not as a power to be appeased. Uh, okay, so that's not the analogy. And, and if you need to take the analogy to its 
fruition, the, the, the ransom is paid to God the Father to satisfy His justice and His wrath against sin and, and sinners. We see another example that, uh, or, or another expression of that by Peter in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 24. There's a lot of correlations here between um, this passage and what Peter shares with his um his people. First Peter two twenty four. He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree, so that we might die to sin and live for righteousness. By his wounds you have been healed. Amen. Amen. Okay. Pay attention to that little phrase at the end, for many. For many. Again, this is what we call substitution. It's one thing to say Christ died. <coughs> it's another thing to say Christ died for me. Amen. So substitution. In my place or instead of me. I should have been on that cross. That should have been the punishment I received, but He did it for me. That's what we believe as, as Christians. We call that substitution. Um, now many here implies the potential of all. Some have used this. Those of you who are really rich uh, and experienced in doctrine may have heard of the term limited atonement um, in, in Calvinism or Reformed theology. Um, and this has been used as a proof text for that. And uh, we don't need to really go there. 1 Timothy 2, 5-6 through six is a, explains that many is the same thing as all. It's contrasting one with many. Um, so what's 1 Timothy 2, 5 and 6 say? For there is one God and one mediator between God and mankind, the man Je Christ Jesus, who gave himself as a ransom for all people. Okay, yeah. As a ransom for all people. So elsewhere, you'll see these words almost used interchangeably. Now, practically speaking, we know that not all people everywhere will be saved. That's called universalism, and we reject that because the Bible says that there are those who are going to be lost. Practically speaking, we know that only those who believe and receive Christ are saved. And only God truly knows whose ransom have been paid by the blood of Jesus. That's kind of theoretically for us as believers. God knows we don't know. We share the gospel with all. We, we pour it out liberally and, 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 and let God uh, work in people's hearts. Uh, and we can see how God works, um, but we can't see into people's hearts. So, But the emphasis is that the one died for the many. Just like one man, Adam, brought sin into the world, one man, Christ, brought right redemption and righteousness into the world. The one for the many. All right, we got into some theology there. That's interesting stuff. All right, here's some practical application. And again, feel free to, I have some questions too, but feel free to interrupt. Uh, Simple application, be wary of self-centeredness. How easily it is to add self-interest <laughs> self to our worship and service. I know as a pastor, it is a very fine line between doing things for the Lord and then sliding into that worldly thing where it's about me. It's, it's easy to do that. So we got to be cautious of that. We got to be careful about that. I, <laughs> Yeah. About that because it's so relevant to what uh, happened to me a, a week or so ago when my husband had had some surgery and uh, I had prayed for his uh, um, healing, etc. Mm -hmm. and, um, uh, and, and continued because as it was going on and so forth and so on. And, and I was praying. I mm -hmm. mean, I was, uh, God and I have a wonderful relationship and, mm -hmm. and all. And, uh, and there were a time when there was an issue and I, I calmed him down. And, uh, and then they took care of him and I had to go home. They made me go home. And I'm thinking as I'm driving in the car, oh, thank you, Lord, for, um, you know, uh, working. And, 
and I got feeling like it was me mm. doing it. I mm -hmm. was weary, and mm -hmm. it was, a, it was, a, but I got, I got thinking, you know, Carol, look at what you did. You did this, look at mm -hmm. and Satan has such a way mm -hmm. of stealing our joy mm -hmm. when we think we're doing something for the Lord, and and so we have to be. It is such a fine line, folks. Yeah. I'm you. <laughs> and it doesn't mean we have to go around with a sourpuss face no, and, and you, you know, but we got to be even careful. About it Absolutely. Even about it. Yeah. <laughs> Who's got 2 Timothy 2.22? No, you want to say something? I was just going to say sometimes mm -hmm. in my prayers, mm -hmm. it feels like I'm asking God for something that I want rather than I should, you should ask it in his will yeah. and, and for him to be glorified. And sometimes I find myself going, please take care of this. And, and yeah. I, have to, I have to think about that. Yeah. Yeah. I, I try to do that with my ministry. I, do, I, I pray to God every day. God bless my ministry. Not, you know, and then I add to it. Not because of me and my glory, but for your glory and your good and the growth of the kingdom and the encouragement of the saints and salvation of the lost. And I write it down so that I make sure I, I say that, you know. Um, but I cross that line occasionally, and God's usually pretty good about thumping me on the head. <laughs> Second Timothy 2.22. Flee also youthful lust, but follow righteousness, faith, charity, peace with them that call on the Lord out of a pure heart. Out of a pure heart. That's the phrase I wanted to focus on. We want to follow God out of a pure heart. And self-centeredness is really where that that can can begin if we're not careful. Number two, be willing to serve sacrificially. Jesus did it, so should we. Uh, maybe rhetorically you can answer this. Uh, how is God speaking to you? In what ways can you be more like a servant and less like a a sultan. I love the, the story. I think it's um, Jeff Foxworthy talking about his recliner. And he gets in his recliner and he is not moving. <laughs> he says, I'm in the re recliner. And, and he'll yell, his, his honey will walk, or his wife will walk by and he'll be like, hey, make me a sandwich. <laughs> you know, <laughs> and, and uh, you know, it's so, you know, it's e like I've said before, it's easy here because it's my job. It's not so easy when I'm at home. Not that I demand a lot from my girls and, and stuff, but um, I can, if I'm not careful, I can slip into that selfishness. I can be a sultan. John 13, 14, and 15. You call me teacher and Lord, you are right, for so I am. If I then, the Lord, and the teacher, wash your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. Okay. So we don't practice foot washing here. Did anybody grow up in a church where you did foot washing? Asher did. Vespers, Sunday Adventists, Vespers do it. Yeah. Yeah. Friday yeah. night they do a foot uh, wash. Yep. And feet are pretty nasty. They can be, at least. Now, I've got beautiful feet. <laughs> Lindsay's jealous of my feet. Why are your feet so soft? Yeah, anyway. Um, because beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. There's a scripture for it. So. But, uh, no, but uh, Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, washed his disciples' feet as an example. And we need to be basin and towel Christians as well. Pick up the basin and the towel and serve one another. Um, in practical, everyday ways. Now, uh, I know you're, you're eager to get out of here. Let's try to answer some questions. Think about this. Obviously, the disciples were blinded by their expectations of Jesus. We've been talking about that for several weeks now. Can you think of maybe expect, expectations of God that you have now or over the years that you've had that you've had to correct as you grew in your faith? I know there are some who kind of got the impression that if you follow Christ, everything's just going to be hunky-dory and no problems, and he's going to fix everything for you, right? Yeah. I think sometimes when we pray for healing and it's not answered, 
we wonder where we've gone. Yeah, yeah. Um, I bet we all have expectations in some way that we need. At first, mm -hmm. I, was, I was kind of hesitant. I thought for sure he's going to send me to Africa or Timbuktu. <laughs> and I thought, I can't afford to do that. Yeah. So that was a wrong expectation, although he does do that to people, but not yet, not yet. Um, if he did, he'd figure out how to pay for it. And, yeah, and you would be fulfilled in doing it. Yeah. Okay. Asher? I'm expecting a resolution in Tom and Erica's situation. Yeah. But I also got to remind myself in his time. Yeah. Yeah. And for his will, in his will, that's that, that was the hardest part. Is yeah. That, you know, trying to take your own will out of the out of the way because you stumble on it. Yeah. And I, oh, Maria. I think we tend to get impatient. I do when I pray and I expect something to happen immediately. Yeah. So, but I think God has shown me daily to be patient. Yeah. I'm not learning, though. Yeah. <laughs> that's a tough one. Yeah. Okay, Jesus highlighted the contrast between worldly and godly leadership. Now, be careful here. <laughs> Would any of you be interested in sharing some good or bad examples of leadership that you've seen or maybe that you yourself have done? Don't call anybody out, <laughs> but... Uh, I, I'm sure, can you think of just a glaring example the Lord put it on your heart that, man, what a great leader that was. Please don't put me in there. I don't want to do that. I got a big enough head already. Uh, Gene. No, we had in our corporation, the one that Maria was a part of too, we had a uh, vice, uh, pre vice president of, of uh, finance. finance whose only skill was humiliating people. Oh. And, <laughs> and I heard that they were going to make him president. Oh, my goodness. So I went up. Mm -hmm. I was just a division leader. I went mm -hmm. up to the, to the chairman of the board, and I said, you know, if you make Dave president, you'll have my resignation on your desk mm -hmm. the same day or mm -hmm. the next day. Mm -hmm. Well, it happened. They talked me in the sting, and about four months later, I was back. Mm -hmm. Well, luckily, I was a cash cow at a company in my division, so he left. But that kind of a person is normally the ambitious type that tries to get to the top of an organization, and they ruin it every time. Mm -hmm. So humility is a pretty good leadership uh, system, I found, in my years. Yeah. I think people get power hungry. Mm -hmm. you know, and, uh, but he was very verbally abusive. Yeah, that's horrible. That's horrible. Cheryl? I had a principal who was uh, very domineering, and she... Uh, as a teacher. As, as a teacher. You, uh, you were a teacher, right? Uh-huh. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. Over all the teachers, and she just had a holier-than-thou attitude that we didn't know how to treat the kids and blah, blah, blah. Well, she, she took a disturbed uh, young man who was in fifth grade into her office, and she was going to get to him, you know, talk to him and stuff. Well, he beat her up. Oh, wow. You know, and she had the wow. door locked and none of us could get in there. And, oh, I mean, my was, goodness. It uh, was really humbling for her. Yeah, I guess. So, yeah. I guess. <laughs> mm. That's what they say about wisdom, you know, humility. If you correct somebody and you're, say, not Christian, they'll hate you for it. But a Christian will love you for the correction because yeah. and then they become wiser. And that's the beginning of all wisdom. Mm -hmm. And when we think of ourselves <coughs> higher than we should, you know, like, well, I do that, or yeah. we're thinking, you know, we overlook things you know, yeah. that the other people see. Right. Amen. Amen. So we need to be more like servants and less like sultans. That's my main idea. You can tell I've preached on it before. <laughs> all right. Let's close with a word of prayer. Thank you for all your participation, input, uh, questions, answers, all of that. I appreciate it. And um, people online actually have, have mentioned that they appreciate it as well. So 
those who are like the pitchers who aren't able. Hey, pitchers, shout out to the pitchers. Um, you know, they watch regularly because they're, they're still up there. So let's close with prayer. Heavenly Father, how grateful we are for the ransom paid by Jesus for our freedom from sin, death, and hell. Give us more grace to be servants. Open our eyes to the sinful ways we behave like sultans. May our leadership grow more and more like Jesus every day. In his holy name, amen. amen.